Now, there's a lot to talk about with this, and I want to break this kind of down into two different pieces. One, I want to talk about the route. I want to talk about where we're going, what to expect, and what to do along the way. And I also want to talk about what to plan, what to take with you, what to worry about, what to make sure that you can take care of, and that kind of thing. Because unfortunately, I, as you've if you've watched any of my Hot Rod Power Tour content before, uh, some of these lessons I have learned have been a little bit expensive along the way. So first off, let's talk about the route. Now, Hot Rod Power Tour over the last many years has been mostly across the South. Uh, in 2021, we did go across uh, Ohio and then over to Indiana, then across to St. Louis, and then up into Illinois and then came back. Um, but the last two years, we've gone across Tennessee, down into Florida and Georgia and Alabama, uh, the Carolinas, and then back up. So uh, this year is going to be kind of a combination of those two things. We're going to actually start in Kentucky, we're going to end up in Indianapolis, but in that route, we're going to kind of do a, one of these things. So we're going to kind of get a smorgasbord of what's going on. Now, we are essentially at this point in time, four months away from this trip. And this trip is taken in the end-ish of June, which can be a very interesting and challenging time period weather-wise. You can either end up with something that's unbelievably scorching, terrible, horrible and face of the sun hot, or you could end up with nice and comfortable. You can end up with rainstorms. You really never know what you're going to get yourself into, but you can do preparedness. Preparedness will kind of work out either way you want to go. So let me kick open the screen here and we're going to talk about the route. The first thing you got to do is get there. Now for me, I'm starting out in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, day one is going to be at Bowling Green and that means we've got to get ourselves from Columbus, Ohio, all the way to Bowling Green, Kentucky, which the drive before the drive is what I typically would call that. That can actually be one of the most stressful periods of power tour, depending on where you're coming from. We have people that come from East Coast, West Coast, Canada, all over the country. We even have people that fly in and drive cars just for this event. So the event of getting to the event can be quite a extensive amount of driving. We've had people last year, I spoke with a number of people that were from far Northwestern Washington, and they had a basically week or week and a half to be able to get to where we started our drive down in Georgia. Um, and that's cool. You know, that's a good experience. It gives you a chance to be able to experience a whole lot of things across the country. If you can take your time, if you can leisurely lollygag your way around, that's great. The problem is if you don't have that, that time available, uh, if you're working stiff like me and you're not able to do that, uh, you've got to kind of prioritize your time and more or less make a blast from where you are to where you need to be. So for me, that's getting from Columbus, Ohio to Bowling Green, Kentucky. And that's what we're going to see right here. Um, it's a pretty straight shot from Bowling Green to Columbus. Um, unfortunately, it does involve going straight through Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, as well as through Cincinnati. And Cincinnati can be quite a challenge coming through. Um, as you can see here, there's a bit of traffic here. And when it gets into downtown Cincinnati here, this is where things get very, very interesting. And that's going to be something we're going to talk about again a little bit later on. Um, but you're going to make that shot across Cincinnati, and you're going to get yourself all the way down here to Bowling Green, Kentucky, through Louisville, and down here to Bowling Green. Now, as the GPS calls it, that is a five hour and nine minute drive for me, 341 miles. Um, that's as long as everything goes according to plan. This is basically a full day of driving. You're going to have at least six hours in the car because you got to realize I'm not going to be probably driving a car that can go 341 miles. You're also, usually speaking, it's a good idea to do this trip with other people. So you're going to want to do this where you have friends or compatriots or at least other folks that are going to caravan with you. Now, 95% of us are going to find people on Facebook to be able to go organize trips with. Um, if you're not in your region yet on a Facebook group for Hot Rod Power Tour, that's your number one resource. If you don't have a group of friends that are like real life friends that are going to be doing this, um, the next best thing you can do is to get on one of those Facebook groups and start organizing when you're going to leave, who's driving, what you're taking, who's taking supplies, that kind of thing. Um, cause if you go with a group, if you go as a caravan, you've got kind of a support network there. You've also got the ability to kind of, um, encourage each other and help each other down the road. 
So even aside from, from traffic jam problems or car breakdown problems, it's just nice to have other people that are with you on that road trip. And it is a little bit more fun versus just getting on the interstate and blasting from wherever you are to wherever you need to be. So that's going to be kind of tip number one. If you can get on Facebook or in your local car club, however it is you, you communicate, get in there and be able to start developing a team that's going to be able to do this trip with you. It's going to make the drive a whole heck of a lot easier. So we're going to start here in um, Bowling Green, Kentucky on day one, Beach Bend Raceway Park. Um, and that's, uh, that's going to be fine. That's not going to be a problem. It's right outside of Bowling Green. Um, it's going to be a good time. I think they're going to be pretty well organized. I don't think it's going to be a problem. Uh, it is a smaller town, so we, we, we might get a little bit tricky there, but, uh, for the most part, not a problem. Most people are going to end up staying in Bowling Green that night because most of the people on day one, our day zero are going to drive down, stay the night, and then stay the night again on day one, uh, and then get up on day two and make the blast from your day one spot to your day two spot. Now, if you are a vendor person or if you're part of the show, um, a lot of times those people will actually make the drive ahead of schedule. So they'll do it that night. They'll break down everything and then get in a car or truck or whatever and make that blast to wherever the next stop is so that they can be there ready to go whenever anybody gets to the show. Now, the weird thing with this whole process is not really weird, but the difficult or different thing that you're going to find with power tour is there's a lot of different ways to do this. There are people that are going to take the fastest possible route and they're going to blast there first thing in the morning. There are people that are going to do it overnight. There are people that are going to take the long road round. There are the people that are going to take the official route. There's the people that are going to be broken down or they're going to be sleeping in the night uh, or that, that next morning. So they're not going to leave until later on in the day. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. There's a lot of different groups. So make sure you understand what your plan is, whether or not that's going to ever happen, but what your plan is on when you're going to leave, what your route you're going to take is, uh, and who you're going to be with. So that way you can kind of keep things as organized as possible. Otherwise, this can get pretty dang hectic. Now, the day one thing, I'm not honestly that worried about. Day two can be a little worrisome. This is the drive from... Bowling Green, Beach Bend Raceway Park, down to Nashville. Um, Super Speedway in Nashville last year, or two years ago, um, was by far our biggest nightmare of the entire power tour. Uh, and there were a lot of nightmares because that year was kind of like face of the sun hot. Um, it is only technically an hour and 44 minutes and 80 miles to go from Bowling Green, Kentucky, to Nashville, Tennessee, no, outside Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but there's a number of different ways you can take this. There is going to be an official route. And normally speaking, that's going to be something like this, where you're going to blast off into these little tiny towns. You're going to do the little thing on the sides. Um, I'm going to guess it's going to be something like a 231 here, where you're kind of coming down and you're staying off the interstates. Um, and that 231 route is basically the same amount of time. You're just doing it off the interstates. A big portion of what Power Tour is about is giving you a chance to experience the point A to point B, not necessarily the get there as fast as possible kind of thing, um, but up to you on how you want to do that. That's that's a totally your kind of call thing. There will be an official route. There will be things that you can um you can, you know, caravan with other people if you don't happen to have your own group going. Um, now, this is also something I want to bring up is this is also a wonderful opportunity to explore the area that you're going through. For people who are not from this area, um, there are a lot of things to see. If you happen to be a bourbon person, you are driving through bourbon country um, and you're going to be driving back through bourbon country. So, yes, you only have a technically like hour and a half to two hour drive, but with the route you may want to take, with side trips, with adventures you're going to want to get into, barring any kind of breakdowns or anything, there's a lot of opportunities out there to be able to experience a lot of things. Um, and again, this is a, a really, really nice area of the town. Um, you know, when you're going through this area, you're going to be coming down through some beautiful, beautiful area. And there are a lot of distilleries and that kind of thing around here. You're in horse country. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous in this area. Um, but the number one thing that worries me 
is whether or not Nashville Super Speedway is going to be prepared for us to get there. So if you watch Hot Rod Power Tour 2022 with me, this is this video here. And if you haven't watched this and you're interested in going on and experiencing what Power Tour is truly about, um, I would definitely give this video a watch. This is the experience that we had getting into Power Tour. Um, and it was, mm, let's say, a little bit less than great. Now, that year was face of the sun hot. It was 98 to 102 degrees day in, day out, all day long, every single day down there. So it was really, really a stress test of man and machine. Unfortunately, Nashville was not really prepared for the 5,000 or so cars that are going to come in on power tour that are trying to get into the Nashville super speedway. They had us all limited down to basically one lane going in. Um, and we were slow crawling on blacktop where it was just absolutely abusively bad. You can see here, we actually, I ended up having uh, my friend Jim and I went on this power tour. I have the AMX. He's in my, my Pontiac here, but there were people pulled off in the trees, sitting there, cooling down, trying to keep their cars from overheating. And there were lots of cars that were overheating, lots of cars that were overheating. And that was a major, major problem with Nashville. Now the excuse was, or the reasoning for that was the fact that NASCAR was going to be there that following week. And they have some sort of a stipulation as to the fact that they need to be able to get trucks and trailers in and out of the facility without any problems. So it bottlenecked all of us trying to actually get in there. But that was a multi-hour traffic jam trying to get into Nashville Super Speedway. And I don't really believe that any other YouTubers really made it into Nashville that year um, during the actual show. I think Alex Taylor ended up getting pushed in or pulled in one of the two. She, she melted down the bad marrow outside, but it was just an absolute nightmare. Now this year, if I'm looking at the schedule correctly, Nashville does not have a uh, Nash, the, does not have a NASCAR event that following weekend. So I'm hoping Nashville will have their show together uh, and we can get in there, get our business done, shake hands, kiss babies, do what we do, uh, and then get out of the property without hundreds of cars overheating in the driveway, in the parking lot, on the road in there, or in the show. Um, I'm hoping that's going to be the case. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Um, but that's the number one thing that I'm really worried about is going to be Nashville. That day, Well, like, take that back. That's one of the two things that I'm most terrified about is getting into Nashville, whether or not they have their stuff together. Um and, and whether or not we can get in and get out, you know, depending on the weather, whether or not we're going to make it in and out of that place without a problem. So the next day is actually kind of uh, simple. We're basically just kind of turning around and going back to where we came from. So this is Nashville Super Speedway back to Louisville, Kentucky. So let me click on this here. Uh, back to stage. There you go. Um, Nashville. Super Speedway to Louisville, Kentucky. Here's Bowling Green. So you're basically just driving right back up where through you just came. Now, there are going to be other ways you can do this. If you wanted to kind of kick out this direction and come up through Scottsville, Glasgow, and then come up that way. Um, again, a lot of the power tour thing is about not taking the interstates between X and Y um, and enjoying the highways and byways in the old way we all used to travel. So, I would probably recommend trying a little bit of the highways and byways, um, but you do have at least a three hour drive between um, Nashville and downtown Louisville here. Also keep in mind that this is in downtown Louisville. So traffic is going to be what it is on a work day. So make sure you're paying attention to when you leave and when you're going to be rolling into traffic. So you understand the fact that you may get stuck in traffic on I-65, you may get stuck in traffic in all kinds of different places, especially if you're going through a small town with a blinking red light or places that are stop sign that don't see a large volume of cars, you can end up in a world of hurt sitting idling for a long, long time. So make sure your cooling system is ready to go. Um, but 181 miles, three hours of, of driving, not that bad, depending on how you're going to do it. If you want to kind of take some, the scenic route, you're going to probably add an hour, hour and a half onto the, onto the way. And again, 
This is a beautiful area of the country. There's tons to see, tons to do, lots of great ways to entertain yourself, um, lots of great food, lots of great drinks, tons of history. Depending on what you want to do, there's something for everybody in this area. I love Louisville. It's a great time. It's a great town. Um, should be a great experience. I think everybody's going to have a great time on this day from Nashville to Louisville. Now, the next day is the one that I'm actually concerned about. Um, this is the drive from Louisville to national trails. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is basically me driving back home. Okay. I'm in, I'm in downtown Columbus. What I'm concerned about is the amount of traffic or the amount of distance we're driving and the amount of traffic snafu opportunities we have between point A and point B, being Louisville and National Trails. So if we look at this map, um, you are going from Louisville, depending on where you're staying, I would probably recommend kind of south, northeast of the city if you possibly can. Uh, and you're going to take 71 up all the way to Cincinnati. You can start seeing here in the Florence area where this is already starting to get bad right and that's real-time traffic um my major concern here is there are not a lot of good ways to get across this ohio river right here you basically have two options you take 71 through downtown cincinnati or you take 471 around the city which goes way out here and you can come in town which takes you right back into downtown or you take 275 all the way around the city and jump back in up here in the north. There are just not a lot of great bridge options. If you look at the map here, you've got your bridge here across 471, but for the most part, there's really not much of any kind of bridge options through a lot of this. You're going to have a lot of driving to do. So if you come all the way down here, you can see how out of the range that is. Um, you know, this area is not really a really well-traveled area. It's a pretty area, but there's not a lot of infrastructure here. It's a lot of small towns that are built off of highways. Um, there's not easy ways to get across the river here. There's not bridges. Um, this is going to be a problem. I'll be honest with you. This is the part of this trip that, that scares me the most is this part through Cincinnati. Now, depending on what time you're going to be taking your drive through Cincinnati, this may or may not be a complete nightmare. It may be you get lucky and you get in and out of Cincy without a problem, but just in pure driving alone, you have 234 miles. If you're doing it by the highway and three and a half hours. So you're probably going to burn at least a tank of gas, depending on what you're driving. Um, and this can be a big problem, especially if it's in the late June times and it's busy, depending on road construction, depending on accidents, depending on, there's a lot of different opportunities here for this to go totally sideways on you. And I'm, I'm interested to see how they're planning on routing us for this, to be honest with you. Um, it's one of those things where like, there are other options. Um, they're just, none of them are very good. They're all kind of bad. Um, I am concerned about it because I have now broken my 1970 Pontiac twice uh, <laughs> coming through to, uh, Northern Kentucky on my way back through this direction. Uh, fuel pumps both times and uh, ended up stranded, fixed them both times, but you end up kind of stranded and, and it's a problem. Um, that's going to be a big trick, a big tricky situation is coming through Cincinnati. I'll be honest. That's, that's the part that worries me the most. So once you get through Cincinnati though, your next question is going to be Columbus. The drive from Cincinnati to Columbus is as boring as it possibly can get. Um, everything between about here, Lebanon area and about here is basically flat farmlands, a tiny little bit of turning, but otherwise there's nothing to see. So I would say they're not going to make us do much of any kind of changing of the route here. I think this is just going to be a straight up 71 kind of situation. Now, if you're interested, 
you could take this route over directly here, come across 28 over to Chillicothe and then come up 23. And that would give you a little bit more of the experience of Ohio. Um, and you could come up kind of like the old school way of doing it. Uh, last year when we came back from Bristol, Tennessee, um, you actually can come directly up from Bristol all the way up to uh, Columbus off of 23. And that's that's a, a decently fun drive. But there's just really not a lot to see through this area. Um, now, when you get to Columbus, you are going to take the you're going to take the outer belt around 270. So you're going to come up 71 and you're going to jump on 270 and take this around. Do not miss this change because if you go into downtown, this is all in the middle of a crazy amount of roads construction where 71 and 70 can merge into downtown. It is a nightmare. You do not want to get involved in it and you really don't want to get involved in it in traffic. So by all means, whatever it is you do, however it is you get there, do not miss 270 East or you are going to be in for a nightmare. So 270 East is going to take you around the south end of the city, and then you're going to take 70 all the way out to National Trails. Bing, bang, boom. Bob's your uncle. Life is good. No problem. National Trails is pretty good. Um, it's a big, flat, open area in the middle of a field. It's out east of the city. There's not a lot of infrastructure out there. There's two ways to get there. You either go past the track and you come back, or you go before the track and you come over. Those are really the only two options to get there. But they are really, really used to getting huge amounts of people in and out of that place. There's a lot of parking, so it should be pretty reasonably easy to get in and out of national trails. Um, I hope. Um, now, the question is going to be where you stay here, and I've had a lot of people asking me that. Uh, the answer is you're going to stay in Columbus. Um, if you haven't already figured out your hotels, you're staying in Columbus. There's nothing out here. This is, this is the middle of nowhere. So you could probably find maybe an Airbnb in like the Buckeye Lake area out here if you want. And that's kind of a neat little area. Um, maybe. But otherwise, you're staying in Columbus. Um, there's really not any other built up area that's anywhere near here. If you are looking for something interesting to do that's kind of the highlight of Ohio, you are not terribly far away from Hawking Hills, which is an absolutely gorgeous area. If you've never seen Hawking Hills, check it out online. Um, it's a beautiful area, lots of great roads to drive. It's it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, Hawking Hills is going to be down here. Um, it, and it is going to be a bit of a drive. You're kind of going in the wrong direction. Um, Hawking Hills State Park is down here. But that's something that if you're interested in and you want to kind of go experience some stuff, um, Hawking Hills is, is absolutely beautiful. It's a, it's a really cool place to go. Um, something to keep in mind if you're interested in that kind of thing. It is a bit of a hike because you're going to be going, you know, from here to here. Um, but it's an option. Uh, and there are a couple of places to stay, but not really much. So that day you finish off in Columbus, I would say, hey, welcome to my city. There's tons to do here. Lots of places to go eat. Lots of ways to entertain yourself. We've got everything you could possibly need as far as car parts and that kind of thing goes. Um, if you're interested in stopping at Jeg's, the Jeg's Retail Center is in Columbus. It does have a tiny little bit of parking, but it's on the 11th Avenue store. Uh, so it's right off of 71, right around here. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to go there, you certainly could. But again, there's a tiny little bit of parking. I probably wouldn't unless you absolutely need to go there. The Jegs Warehouse is also in this area. If you need to get something from the Jegs Warehouse, if you have a breakdown or something, that's an option. Um, it is up here just off of Delaware, up here, um, right around here. Um, so if you need to get up there for parts, Jegs is probably your best bet. Um, but it does take you, again, quite a bit out of, out of your way. Now, the last day is a basically straight shot and probably, no, I don't want to say probably, is definitely the most boring part about this entire drive. Uh, you're basically going to get on Interstate 70 and drive west. That's it. You you get to Internet 70 and you drive, drive west. Um, unfortunately, here in the land of corn and flatlands, there's really nothing between here and there that's going to be interesting to see on the route uh, or on the road. And I don't really know what you want to do as far as a route goes. 
that would be any more interesting. If you're looking at it, that's literally it. Um, you're leaving Columbus here. You're driving west across 70. You're going to go cross past Dayton. You're going to go into, into Indianapolis, and, and that's it. And I apologize for the phone ringing. I'm filming this at work, and business happens. Um, now, the Lucas Oil Stadium is basically kind of in downtown since, or Indianapolis. So uh, keep in mind that you're going to need to drive through Indianapolis. Now, this is not nearly as bad as it used to be uh, in years past because some of this is a little bit better with the bridges being um, open again. But this can get a, a tad bit squishy trying to get through here. Um, I would say this day is probably going to be the day where everybody kind of stops doing the um, the scenic route, the back and forth kind of thing, and just kind of hurries their way to, to Indianapolis. Uh, as somebody from this area who's driven this drive a bazillion times, there's really not much to see. The roads suck. Um, there's nothing pretty between there and there. Um, there's construction. There's going to be problems. Get on the highway and just get there. Um, now, there are side routes. There are side trips that you could certainly do. Um, uh, if you're interested in that, Carrie and I actually went to go see in the first one in 2021 that we did um, uh, a bomber that was being built. It's actually probably come a long way since we were there last. Um, but there are things to see. Right, Patterson. Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, and the Air Force Museum is all are in that area when you're going through Dayton. Um, there are things to see, but as far as a route goes, there's just not really much of anything to talk about. I mean, there's just get on I-70 and, and head west. I really wouldn't bother unless you're shooting off to go visit somebody specifically or there's something that you want to see that's here or here. And if there is, Drop it in the comments section because I'm kind of curious as far as what it is that's between there and there that you're interested in seeing because I've driven this drive a whole bunch of times and I pretty much just get myself to Indianapolis. Uh, but it's a 221 mile drive, which is going to be about a tank of gas for most of us classic car guys, uh, at least that are running old school stuff. Um, it's going to have somewhere between three and a half and four and a half hours, depending on construction and traffic and breakdowns. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a blast, but it's pretty dang boring and it is pretty well built up all the way across there. You've got cities, um, that are pretty well across this entire thing. So if you do end up with a problem, uh, you should have pretty good coverage as far as, uh, having to worry about, you know, be out, being out in BFA and not having anybody to, to support you or anything like that. So, um, that's the route. That's the interesting, the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting uh, year this year. Um, I, I enjoy driving across Kentucky. It's going to be great. Nashville is wonderful. I love Nashville. Um, pick your poison as far as what you want to do in Nashville. You've got dining, entertainment, music, drinking, dancing, beautiful areas to drive through. Pick your poison, whatever it is you want to do in Nashville. It's great. Louisville, absolutely fantastic city. Super fun. Lots of great places to eat and drink. I'm a fat guy. Eat and drink is important to me. Um, there's lots of, of horse stuff to do. There's, there's bourbon stuff to do. There's uh, just generally lots of beautiful area in that world. Um, the, the things that I'm going to be worried about are the Nashville situation. Hopefully that's going to be better than it was before when we were there and the getting to national trails situation. Those are going to be your two biggest sticking points. Now on that vein, what I would caution you to do, and I am going to say this out loud is make sure you have at least a little bit of hand tools and a little bit of commonly failed items. Um, in my case, that's going to be fuel pumps. Um, I'm going to have at least one spare fuel pump with me, depending on what I drive. I still haven't figured out that yet, and we're going to have another video following. That's going to be about what the heck I'm going to take, because I honestly don't have that figured out yet. But um, depending on what you're driving... Make sure you have fuel pumps. You might even honestly want to take a spare tire. Uh, we did end up with a spare tire issue last, or with a tire issue last year with Carrie on the on the road trip, um, and he ended up blowing a tire. And we ended up having to miraculously get it, score another one to be able to get him back on the road and get and get running again. Um, so if you have a chance to be able to throw a spare tire, hopefully you've got a square set, um, put one in the trunk if you can. Um, take water, 
take snacks, probably take some coolant, take some spare oil, take a jump pack, take some spare tools, and take at least a couple of commonly failed items on your vehicle. Um, you know your car better than anybody. You probably helped build it or, or built it yourself. Um, so you know what, what your common failure items are. Just make sure you happen to have them. Um, what you don't want to have is be in the middle of absolutely nowhere and get stuck trying to order a $15 or $20 part and not have any ability to do that. Uh, my last time I broke down in my Pontiac, I ended up in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. And all I needed was a $30 mechanical fuel pump. And it took eight hours of transferring things around to be able to get it. I finally got it. I wasted an entire day. I got the car fixed and I got back on the road. Super easy fix, not a big deal, not expensive, but you end up stuck forever. And if you end up doing that on power tour, you can end up kind of throwing your entire power tour out of whack. Now, there are those of us that every single year are going to be rolling into the very end of the show because we had problems or because we're helping to support somebody else who had problems. And that's one of the major, major things about Power Tour is those caravans of like-minded, wonderful, hot rod, healthy people. That's the best part about it is the ability to drive through the, the, the countryside is great. The venues are fun. Getting there is cool. Seeing the vendors and getting all that stuff, that's all well and good. But the people and the experiences along the way are what this entire thing is all about. I know that probably sounds a little bit corny, but the people and the experiences you have with those people, the things that you share with those people are really what makes Power Tour memories what they are. And it makes that experience that much better. Um, so, again, as I mentioned before, see if you can get yourself a group of people that is already communicating at this point in time, or if not, start your own Facebook group, start your own text message thread, whatever it is, however you want to communicate, set up a place that you guys meet up and have dinner or whatever, once every other week or every month or whatever between now and then. So everybody kind of understands what's, who's driving what, who's bringing what, who's, you know, where are you staying, that kind of stuff. So you guys can kind of organize and develop yourself a caravan because it's it makes the experience that much better when you can share it with somebody else. Um, and if you happen to have a problem or if they happen to have a problem, it gives you a support network because most of us are going to be well outside of our help range. Um, you know, none of us are driving with a truck and a trailer behind us with spare parts and tools and stuff. It's basically whatever you can fit in your car, plus all your luggage and everything else you need. So we're almost all going to be really limited on what we can have. So it's good to have a network of people around you to be able to help you out. So that is Hot Rod Power Tour 2024. That is the plan. That is what's going down. Uh, all we got left to do is to do it. Now, as I said, I have no idea what I'm taking yet. I know I am going. I, am, I already have my long haul pass purchased. I will be there on Hot Rod Power Tour 2024 but I have absolutely no idea what I'm driving yet. I've got a ton of different options and I will bring all that stuff up in a follow-up video probably in the next couple of days. Uh, life's a little bit crazy for me right now and I'm not entirely sure when this is going to work out, but probably in the next couple of days, I've got a number of different options as far as what I, what I can drive for Power Tour and I'm going to leave that kind of up to you guys as far as what you think I should drive. My 1979 AMC Spirit AMX is probably staying home this year. It has nothing left to prove. It's done three in a row. It's done. But I've got a lot of other toys to drive and we'll see where that goes. So there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, hopefully it's educational, maybe a little bit of entertaining. And uh, if you're interested, we're just a small town shop here in central Ohio that does a lot of cool stuff. Work on a lot of cool cars. But uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, click on the uh, subscribe button. Drop me a comment in the comment section below. If you have any questions or anything, I do my very, very best to stay on top of all the comments that are in the comment section. Um, if you've got ideas of places for people to go on any of those days that are in there, side quests, um, points of interest that people might want to be interested in seeing and stopping at, drop that in the comment section below. We'll start this whole conversation going. Um, and then uh, I'll see you soon for talking about what the heck I'm driving. So have a great one, guys. Thanks for being here. Take care.